What caught my eye in the news today I thought I would share with you is that George Soros, the legendary investor at 85 years old, has gotten hands on again. What's he doing? He's betting bearishly on the economy. He's buying silver Wheaton, he's buying Barrick Gold, and he's buying gold miners. Isn't that interesting? And with it, he's, of course, has billions of dollars to bet on those uh, uh, plays, and he's doing it. So is he right? We'll find out. But uh, closer to all of us is what happened in Tel Aviv yesterday. Two Palestinians killed four Israelis in one of the deadliest attacks in a wave of violence that has lasted for nine months. The terrorists came from the West Bank. Now Israel has deployed hundreds of additional troops to that area. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with the security cabinet today. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Closed circuit TV and cell phones caught the terror attack as it happened. People in the restaurant scrambled for their lives. The terrorists killed four Israelis and wounded several others. Paramedics treated uh, around 10 uh, casualties, amongst them at least one in a critical uh, condition. We are still at the scene surveying and looking for additional uh, casualties. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu landed from his state visit to Russia soon after the shootings and toured the scene. This is a, a savage uh, crime, murder, uh, and terrorism in the heart of Tel Aviv. Police shot and wounded the two terrorists, who are cousins from an Arab village near Hebron. They slipped through the security net Israel established to guard against these kinds of attacks. Most potential attacks are thwarted. While Israelis mourned the dead and wounded, some Palestinians celebrated. For example, Ismail Haniyeh, the head of Hamas, tweeted, Glory and salutations to the Hebronites. He also included a victory sign emoji. Hamas said it was just the first surprise in store for Israelis during Ramadan. This footage of applause and cheering comes from Jerusalem Arabs at the Damascus Gate. These pictures are of Palestinians in the West Bank passing out candy to celebrate the attack. So why are they giving out candies in the street? Because when a population is told that this is what their God wants of them, this is going to bring about uh, the redemption of humanity. Killing the Jews is a condition for the redemption of humanity. So, of course, then it's a celebration every time an Israeli is killed. Itamar Marcus, director of the Palestinian Media Watch, says killings in the recent wave of terror are glorified, not just by Hamas, but also by Fatah, the political party of the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. During this entire terror wave, which began in October 2015, the Palestinian Authority and Fatah, the ruling party of, uh, of Mahmoud Abbas, have given absolute support to the terrorists who murdered four Israelis yesterday, who were captured by Israel, are now going to go to jail. And from this day onward, they will now be receiving salaries, monthly salaries from the Palestinian Authority. How can the Palestinian Authority expect the world to believe that they are fighting terror, that they are against terror? Marcus believes unless the indoctrination stops, murders like the one in Tel Aviv's Sarona Market will continue. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I hope this is a wake-up call for some of the blind uh, so-called statesmen in Europe and uh, other capitals, including the United States State Department, that feels that there's a two-state solution coming along, that Israel is going to find a partner for peace in the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas. He doesn't want peace. He wants to kill Jews. And I think it's time that people recognize that this is an illusion, a chimera that they have created, that there's this so-called two-state solution. And unfortunately, the Israeli leaders have gone along with it, but it isn't going to happen ever. Well, here at home, we know who's going to be running for president. But who will Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton choose as their running mates for vice president? Well, that's, uh, we're looking into the crystal ball on this one, and John Jessup has that story. Well, Pat, neither candidate has talked about specific names, but most political analysts believe the choice will come from a handful of possible running mates. George Thomas has the story. With Clinton and Trump facing historically negative views from voters, 
Analysts say selecting the right vice president could make a difference in a tight race. I'm looking at the most qualified people, and that includes women, of course. While Clinton hasn't said publicly who she's considering, likely names include Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Julian Castro, Labor Secretary Thomas Perez, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine, and Colorado's Governor John Hickenlooper. And then there's Bernie Sanders. Most analysts say neither Clinton nor Sanders have any interest in teaming up after their bruising primary. Still, Clinton knows that she'll have to work hard to win over her rival's fierce supporters. Because I think uh, his campaign uh, has been a, a really dynamic uh, and exciting experience for uh, the millions of Americans, particularly young people who supported him. On the Republican side. Some people say I'm too much of a fighter. My preference is always peace, however. Donald and Trump says he's looking for someone with experience in government as opposed to an outsider like him. The last thing we need is Hillary Clinton in the White House or an extension of the Obama disaster. Trump explained what he's looking for in his choice a few months ago at a Regent University presidential forum with Pat Robertson. I would want somebody that could help me with government. So most likely that would be a political person. Trump has reportedly narrowed his choices to four or five candidates. And although he hasn't named names, those suspected to be on the short list include Ohio Governor John Kasich, Texas Senator Ted Cruz, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Tennessee Senator Bob Corker, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. As both candidates turn their attention to the general election, deciding on a vice president will be an important decision. And who they pick will also tell voters a lot about the candidate of their choice. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. Pat, any advice for the candidates on the Veep stakes? Well, I'm sure Hillary is looking strong at uh, Tim Kaine here in Virginia. She needs to win Virginia, and uh, he is a... Uh, Catholic, uh, former missionary, and and uh, he's done very well in Virginia, and he he might play very well as a uh, moderate uh, to moderate her uh, stance. I don't know if she's taking thinking of him, but I don't know. If Sherrod Brown from Ohio brings that much credibility. Uh, as far as the Republicans go, I think hands down it ought to be John Kasich. He would bring Ohio, and and Trump needs to win Ohio to win the White House. Uh, he is an expert in government. He ran the House Budget Committee for years. Uh, he knows how to deal with Congress because he's been there and he was brilliant in handling the finances of the state of Ohio. Question is whether he'd take it. I'm not sure he would. So uh, uh, they're, they've got some other good choices. And of course, uh, Senator Corker is a terrific guy and uh, uh, he would. Uh, bring a lot of credibility because of his experience in the Senate. So we'll see. But Trump knows what he's doing on this one, and I'm sure he's going to make a good a good pick. We had Newt Gingrich on the other day, and, and he is, of course, extremely articulate. We'll see what happens. John? Pat, House Speaker Paul Ryan is laying out his plan to secure the U.S. border. Ryan wants to overhaul the immigration system and install strong defenses to keep out terrorists, criminals, and drug cartels. His plan is aimed at protecting national security. Ryan is expected to propose high fencing along with the use of technology and deploying air assets with personnel. Ryan says the U.S. has repeatedly failed to eliminate serious vulnerabilities in the immigration system, including not knowing whether visitors to the U.S. actually leave when their visas expire. Antidepressants may not be effective in treating younger children and teens and could potentially be dangerous. That's the finding from a new medical analysis. Health Day News reports out of 14 antidepressants studied, only one, Prozac, was more effective in treating depression than a placebo. One expert says it isn't clear how antidepressants work in children and how they affect their developing brains. Another says he would never give antidepressants to young children, and Pat, he said only sparingly to teens. What I understand, so many of these random shootings that take place, and you say, well, how come they're doing that? Why do they go into the theater and open fire with guns? Well, virtually all of them have been taking some kind of medication, some type of antidepressant. And uh, 
it does lead to psychoses, it leads to hallucination, it leads to all kinds of things that are necessarily bad. I, I think we have a pharmacopoeia, if I can use that term, that is quite effective in uh, dealing with mental in illness, but only in the hands of somebody who is very highly skilled in the use of these things and only in a limited quantity. They are not to be prescribed for children and they're not to be prescribed like candy. They, they just aren't something that people should take willy-nilly because they lead to terrible consequences. John? Well, Pat, continuing on the topic of antidepressants, they are the second most prescribed group of drugs. And new research reveals a shocking number of doctors are advising their patients to take an antidepressant for problems other than depression. As Lori Johnson reports, that could create even more difficulties for some people. Ever since the 1980s, when antidepressants first became popular, their use has exploded an astounding 400 percent. It's gotten to the point where now more than one out of every 10 people is on one. Surprisingly, nearly half of the people using antidepressants aren't even taking them for depression. According to a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a whopping 45% of antidepressant prescriptions are given to treat things like anxiety, migraines, ADHD, and pain. Also, fibromyalgia, PMS, insomnia, and sexual dysfunction. Antidepressants are not FDA approved to treat many of the conditions for which they are prescribed. And there is little to no scientific testing to determine whether antidepressants even help people suffering from these so-called off-label ailments. A study author said these doctors are prescribing in the dark. People on these drugs for long periods of time become apathetic and indifferent. They don't care as much. They don't have as much empathy. Psychiatrist Peter Bregan, whose work influenced warning labels on antidepressants, says their dangers are often overlooked. There are people who feel they can never get off antidepressants because they have such terrible discomforts in their body, in their brains, and their minds coming off the drugs. The fact that the withdrawal symptoms are so difficult indicates how much these drugs change the brain. In his book, Medication Madness, Bregan documents what he warns are their dark side. The antidepressants cause violence and they cause suicide and they do it in all age groups. We have studies in all age groups. There's just no doubt about it. Doctors who come down on both sides of the antidepressant debate agree. Research needs to be done on their effectiveness for uses other than depression. However, those studies are costly and usually paid for by the drug manufacturers, who may not be motivated to foot the bill. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Pat, back to you. Some lady I heard years ago was talking to her neighbor who just moved in. He said, honey, uh, whatever's going on, just stay stoned. Don't, don't worry about what's happening in life. Just stay stoned. And that's, that's what happens. I mean, it's either marijuana or it's cocaine. Uh, but these things are every bit as bad as heroin and, and the other hard drugs. And they're, you know, they're addictive. And they should be prescribed, as I say, by very skilled psychotherapists who have extensive training and only on a very limited basis. And to broad scale uh, prescribe them is devastating. But to think that four million prescriptions are being so, it's just uh, 40 percent up uh, in what they, they're doing. It's just outrageous. And folks, uh, you know, We'll listen to some warnings. We, we, we're killing ourselves with these things, and everybody thinks, well, life is so stressful. I just got to take it easy, and this is one way of relieving stress. Just pop a couple of pills. Well, it doesn't work that way. There's a consequence to everything you do, and I think people need to understand that. There is a cause, and there is an effect, and the effect is very devastating.